Greetings, Minecrafters, and welcome to episode two of the ACOA, or Adult Children of Alcoholics series. Uh, my name is Kimberly Quinn, and it is my honor and privilege to have this chat with you today. Also, uh, any of you listening again to the YouTube, the Minecraft YouTube, these are not exactly the same. Might be similar, but not exactly the same. And actually, I don't think I even did one online for the, the Minecraft YouTube. But anyway, today's topic is, with the ACOAs, is when lying is the norm. You know, and really when we're talking about lying, I'm going to actually broaden it to deceptive because lying to me is a straight out, more direct, you know, more overt, obvious veer from the truth. Whereas deception can be just as much of a veer from the truth, but it can also be more subtle and take, you know, a sort of look different. It can look like broken promises or, um, implications that don't pan out or, you know, things like that. And before I go another step further, I also want to do a shout out to Janet Jeringer Wojcic and Claudia Black, even though I'm not actually um, reading anything from her today, because the two, these two power women have influenced me with, uh, you know, the adult children and alcoholics, you know, recovery, healing journey. And so Janet Jeringer Wojcic is author of the book, Adult Children of Alcoholics. So I'll be kind of pulling from that a little bit. So basically, uh, families who are, you know, have all kinds of addiction going on or not, they can be dysfunctional families without the substance use part. This, the, the, the thing is, is that an addicted family system, you know, it sort of inherently has, you know, dis you know, dysfunction and um, often violence, obviously, and, and, and just shapes us in a way that's different from a non-substance using household. And so Janet talks about um, lying. It says lying is, a, is basic to the family system affected by alcohol. It masquerades in part as overt denial of unpleasant realities, also uh, gaslighting, but anyway, cover-ups, broken promises, and inconsistencies. It takes many forms and has many implications, although it is somewhat different from the kind of lying usually talked about. It's certainly a departure from the truth. Okay, so I mean, right out of the gate, uh, because, you know, I, and for me, I think of lying, again, it's just very super, you know, crystal clear, you know, somebody just crossed the street and they said, I did not cross the street, you know, kind of thing. But it, it's way broader than that. And even, uh, you know, Janet starts right out with a basic denial of that pink elephant with the purple polka dot sitting on the couch and just denying that there's alcoholism or whatever other uh, drug use and abuse in the family and denying the unpleasant realities is the way she puts it. You know, and they, they don't, they can be anywhere from mild to severe. We're going to get into um, not minimizing your situation later. But for right now, it could be dad's passed out in his underwear in the recliner. And then you have friends come to the door and you didn't notice because you came from another direction. And then whoop, there went that, you know, embarrassment. And then denying that that happened later, you know, dad, God, I was, can you, you know, throw a blanket over you or something? I, my friends came to the door and they proceeded maybe to walk right back to my bedroom and pretend not to notice. He says, Oh, what are you talking about? You know, I, I was, watching the football game, you know, whatever, and just like not validating that you really were in your little underoos in the recliner. And my friends saw, you know, they all pretended not to for my sake to protect me from embarrassment, even though I turned nine chains of red because we all know it's true. And then denying it or even not blatantly denying it, but not acknowledging it, right? Those are different. Saying it didn't happen is blatantly denying it and gaslighting, really, because that's making you think like you're the one who's nuts and, and like, did I really see that? Um, and just skimming right over the top of it without overtly denying it. Both are still deceptive. They're still deceptive and, and invalidating of what your reality is. And this is enormously, enormously harmful to a child and a, and a teenager. And yeah, adults too, but we're, we're kind of focusing on the earlier years here. Enormously harmful to, to have your reality questioned like that. You know, and then there's also the cover-ups, right? So there's the complete ignoring that the pink elephant with the purple spots is on the couch. Then there's kind of sort of acknowledging it covertly by throwing a blanket over it because it wouldn't be 
I need to throw a blanket over it. If we're in an it to throw something, a blanket over, right? Though there's a big cover up. And there might be all kinds of talking. Well, I worked hard all day and I did this and blah, 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 blah. And just throwing a big old, you know, blanket on top of that elephant. Then there are blatant broken promises. And again, we're not looking for perfect. You remember that we're talking about the alcoholic or drug addicted or both family or dysfunction without the substance use. Um, that we're not, there's no such thing as a perfect parent or perfect family. So that realize that that is not the bar. And I'm thinking of actually Donna Winnicott back in the fifties did a lot of work on the, uh, about the good enough mother, which that was the fifties. So that, that's how they did things. So we would strive so far, you know, strive to say the good enough parent or, uh, you know, which means the high majority of the time, the high majority of the time you were loved, well taken care of, responded to, validated the high majority of the time. Not 100% because that isn't realistic. And Donald Winnicott's uh, research, you know, basically, this is like all paraphrased. I actually just thinking about this at this minute. You know, it turned out that children who grew up in a home with a good enough, with a good enough parent were, you know, successful and happy and well-adjusted adults. Again, not looking for perfect. With the addicted home, the inconsistencies often prevail over, uh, you know, more a more steady, reliable existence, right? So broken promises count as deception because the child doesn't, it's like walking on quicksand. They don't know what to expect Well, in the inconsistency. So all of this is part of what we're talking about. We're talking about lying and deception, even though those words before this, before this podcast might have meant, might have meant something different to you. And so basically what I'm saying is, even though this is, you know, maybe not how lying has, has been talked about for you earlier on, you know, growing up in school or whatever, and however it's been defined, no matter how you cut it up, it's a departure from the truth, which again is what we call deception. So really the first biggest, like the biggest, most basic lie is the family system denying that there's even a problem. You know, and there's all kinds of ways to do this with the verbiage, right? Well, I worked all day, especially, in fact, especially if you've had like a pass, a pass out, fall down, more obvious drunk, this is still happening, right? Very much so, because kids are definitely afraid to challenge their parents uh, on, on things in general. Um, though if you had a functional alcoholic or a dry drunk, I had both of those, a functional alcoholic in your family, it's even easier for them to kind of, you know, throw the blanket over it or even gaslight. Because like, what do you mean? I'm getting up and going to work. I come home. I, I, I provide a roof. I provide, you know, dinner. You have clothes on your back. You know, knock it off. Go clean your room or something, right? And without, you know, just denying that there's all this dysfunction going on and throwing a huge wrench in unconditional love because alcoholism and other drug addictions show, throw a gigantic wrench in the mirroring of self-value and unconditional love, which, which really lead, you know, shape us in a way that can lead to big, huge problems later on in our adult relationships. So again, for the functional alcoholic, which means they're still, um, I don't want to go ahead and define that. You can find that defined lots of places. Basically they're, they're abusing substances daily and still going to work and kind of, you know, doing all that, but there's still a lot of dysfunction around the dry drunk is somebody who's abstinent and or in recovery. Those are not the same thing. Abstinent, abstinent means to simply not drink at all every day. Um, and whether whatever other drug that that person is doing, they're not doing it. Um, and though just because they're abstaining does not mean that they're in recovery and actually actively working. Let's say like with the 12, I'm just the 12 steps programs in AA or, um, um, and the, the different, the different anonymouses for different drugs and gambling and sex addiction and all that stuff that they're, you know, just abstaining doesn't get you healthier. I mean, it's, it's admirable and it's great that they stop. That's a good first step, but it doesn't actually necessarily involve any personal growth. It's just stop. It's just stopping drinking or whatever. Also saying someone, saying someone is in recovery does also not necessarily mean the recovery either. So talking about actively working the 12 steps when we're talking about AA, let's say, actively attending meetings, actively looking at what's underlying the addiction and actively working to make progress 
with these issues for the benefit of oneself and eventually, hopefully, for the benefit of the family and friends in that person's life. And okay, so the cover-up thing can also be in the form of enabling. There may have been a non-alcoholic parent or non-drug-addicted parent kind of throwing a blanket over the alcoholic parent or drug-addicted parent, you know, um, you know, you know, they may have been talking on the phone, making excuses for your mother or father, not, you know, showing up at the game, not showing up at the open house night at school, not doing this, not doing that. Um, also, I'm thinking of a good friend of mine whose, whose dad uh, used to come home from work. He didn't know this for years that his father was, was a, was a very active alcoholic because his mom was an enabler and threw a blanket over the whole thing. So he went in the, he was a functional alcoholic, worked every day of his life. He would kind of go in the side door and upstairs for a nap uh, until dinner when he got home from work. And then by the time dinner came, he was relatively sober. And so that we, that went on for years and my friend never knew um, until he eventually died of alcoholism. And so there's just all different ways we can cover up and the enabling parent is typically really good. They have their black belt in deception and uh, again, it's not said with judgment because it's th- this whole addicted family system is complicated and it involves um, just all different dynamics. And the idea is not to judge. The idea is to explain, maybe describe is what we're doing here. And so obviously there can be lots of broken promises and, you know, and then make up promises that also don't pan out. And that's all a form of lying because it's all a form of deception. And so it's important to wrap our heads around this new definition because, Again, when we grow up in this alcoholic environment, that is that is our normal. We don't know what normal is because that's all we have to go from. And so it's easy to kind of be in denial ourselves. Oh, I, that wasn't really lying. That was Yes, it was. Because it, here's the thing. If it's not the truth, then it's a lie. It, it, even even if it's not as, as evident, it's still a departure from the truth, which is what, we, what we're talking about. So Janet says in her in her book, Lying is the norm in your house became part of what you knew and what could be useful to you. At times, it made life much more comfortable. If you lied about getting your work done, you could get away with being lazy for a while. If you lied about why you couldn't bring a friend home or why you were late coming home, you could avert unpleasantness. It is about that is an avoidant behavior, too. So definitely it seemed to make life simpler for everybody. Although your family said that telling the truth was a virtue, you knew they didn't mean much of what they said so the truth lost its meaning that is huge right there and it's like oh what a tangled web we we weave and first we are to deceive i'm not i misquoted that maybe a little bit but shakespeare because that's how it becomes easy in general to lie i think we all know that right we even on either on, on the on the listening end even it gets so such an easy easy tangled web we weave as shakespeare said and when we're talking about a dysfunctional family system this gets even easier because we can rationalize it with the need to survive. It's just easier. You know, I don't want to, I, you know, I know you invited me to your house three times, but, but I, my dad's works at night and sleeps in the day to, you know, just make, making stuff up because it's just plain easier than bearing the embarrassment of, or shame of inviting a friend over and then, you know, being em- embarrassed by whatever they might see or being yelled at or who knows, whatever. So we rationalize it because it's easy because we're trying to survive. And the lying or any of the, any of the deception spectrum there then becomes habitual. We become conditioned to depart from the truth for our, our very survival. Yeah, wow, so this is such an important discussion to have. And I'm just thinking of um, at least in, in my household growing up, I I did not experience a lot of blatant lying. It was more in the form of cover-ups, definitely a lot of cover-ups, just secrets. And there's a difference between, like this is what I say to my kids anyway, between private and secret. Something that's private, everybody's got a right to privacy. Of course, your own private thoughts, you know, just, of course. Um, but secrets are toxic. And that's what I'm talking about with cover-ups. You know, the violence in our home was definitely not discussed. You know, big fear with that getting out. Um, all the embarrass- embarrassing behavior, just really embarrassing, embarrassing behavior was not discussed. The infidelity was not discussed. It was just all hidden. And that's all deceptive. And that's kind of what I'm saying here is to 
you know, if this is, if you're listening, you're thinking like, wow, you're really kind of questioning, like I didn't have actual lies, but, 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 right. And all of it is deception. Remember how we're defining that. Anything that's not the truth is deceptive. And it really shapes us. It really shapes us because we become as children, what we experience, what we, especially with our caregivers, um, uh, we, you know, we, 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 we emulate what we see, which is very Bandura, right? If you know about Albert Bandura and social learning or social cognitive theory, uh, children learn what they emulate. And so if we learn, if we're watching people be deceptive, maybe they're telling a partial truth, not the whole truth, whatever, however it is, they're being deceptive. We learn to be comfortable with that. And so adult children of alcoholics can actually sometimes lie when it doesn't even matter. Like I crossed the street. No, you didn't cross the street. Like who cares? But because it became so matter of fact, easy to us that it just became, you know, became easier. And so sometimes later on in adulthood, what we'll, might be called on it by a called out by a partner or something. Why'd you lie about it? They didn't even need to. It's like ridiculous. You know, you said you passed the pepper to so-and-so and you didn't like, who cares? Uh, it's just because it become, we become conditioned and it just becomes easier. It's interesting. I was just having a thought, too, because anybody who knows me knows how much I despise the two L's, lying and lazy. I'm kind of just wondering at this minute, this is why I despise lying so much, because I am as upfront, honest as, as, as I is for me is as humanly possible, because I literally doesn't mean I can't make an error. Obviously, of course, I can, though I hold absolute truth telling to such a it's such a priority for me. I actually practice it. Like, you know, in fact, that's one of my favorite things about Aristotle. I'm a big Aristotle fan. This is very paraphrased, but Aristotle would say, you know, if we practice virtues, you know, like honesty, loyalty, patience, whatever, like we practice a violin, just imagine how good at these we would get. And so to me, practicing honesty is something I embrace very much. I just can't stand lying. And I'm actually wondering if, if, and also manipulation, I don't do that either. It's like, just tell me what you want. Don't try to skirt around it. Um, so I'm, I just actually wanted to share that thought with you. I wonder if it's because I just, I, it's, it feels so, um, <clears throat> I guess it feels like there's a lack of control when there's so much dishonesty because the truth is, is the truth is the truth, right? When there's so much, when there's so many secrets and so many gloss, so much glossing over, so much covering up, I couldn't stand any of that. I just like, just come out with it. Just say it. The truth is what I can hang on to and know what I'm hanging on to kind of thing. Okay. So there you have it. ACOA part two, when lying, you know, deception is the norm. This is Kimberly Quinn signing off from Northern Vermont. Have a mindful, very honest day.